you so much. What a friend we have in Jesus. Well, if you'll remain standing uh, and get your Bible out now and turn once again to the book of the Revelation, and we're still in Revelation chapter number three, Revelation chapter number three, looking at the letter to the church in Sardis. And tonight we want to call our attention uh, specifically, especially on verse number four. Uh, just one verse there, verse number four, Revelation chapter three. And so I'm going to go ahead and begin reading uh, with the beginning of the letter once again in verse one and read down through verse number four. But in verse number four, we want to notice how that the Lord Jesus actually gives a recognition of the remnant, a recognition of the remnant. Revelation chapter three, beginning with verse one. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you once again for the reading of the Word of God. And we thank you again for allowing us to gather together uh, in the Lord's house for this, our midweek service. And Lord, we pray now that you would speak to our hearts by the preaching of the Word of God in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Draw us closer to yourself that we might learn more of you, be better equipped to serve you. And, and then, Lord, we would pray as always for souls to be saved and lives to be changed. We'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, we humbly pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, as we've been studying these letters, remember there's seven of them, uh, seven letters to seven churches. Uh, the letters themselves uh, come from the Lord Jesus Christ. John is really kind of doing the work of a secretary. Uh, he's taking the dictation. He's taking the letters. And then it's his responsibility to see that those letters get to the pastors of those churches and, get, and the letters get out to be read to each one of the various churches. And so we've looked at the letter to the church in Ephesus. And if you can recall some of the things that we've said about each one of the churches, the church in Ephesus, you can refer to as the passionless church. That was the church that Jesus said that one thought that they had was that they had left their first love. And of course, we can use that verse of scripture and we can apply it to uh, uh, losing your enthusiasm for Jesus, using your love for Jesus as part of it. But I think when you examine what we know about the church in Ephesus uh, in the book of Acts and, uh, and even Paul's letter to the church, his letter to the Ephesians, uh, one of the things that they had lost was their love for revival because that church truly started uh, in a revival. And we find that in the book of Acts. And so we call it the passionless church. They lost their love for revival and their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's the church in Smyrna, which was referred to as the persecuted church. The church in Smyrna, Jesus had no words of condemnation or complaint at all. They were a church that were suffering great persecution. It was a time of persecution, the time that maybe that you've even studied about or you know about in history where the Romans would take the Christians and put them into the uh, uh, Colosseum and turn the lions loose. Uh, they put them to death, you know, in various ways and make sport of it. That was the, the persecution. Uh, Smyrna was the persecuted church. Pergamos was a patronizing church. And then Thyatira was a permissive church. But this church in Sardis that we're looking at now, uh, we could call it a professing church but it was not a possessing church. They had a problem of professing uh, uh, that, they, uh, that they were saved, that they were a church, but there was a lack of a real possession of life in, in the Lord. In verse number one, you notice again how Jesus said, I know thy works. 
that thou hast a name and that thou livest, and then he said, and art dead. They had a reputation, they had a name. They were a lively church, but yet Jesus says in his viewpoint of them, they, they were dead, they were spiritually dead. And so you could think of it as a professing church, but, uh, but without a possession. They were spiritually dead. It was a church that was in need of revival, in a great need of revival. In verse two and in verse three, Jesus gives an exhortation and he lays down some requirements for revival. And it's the same thing that we need today. And we looked at this, this, this last time on Sunday evening. And four things that Jesus shows them and shows us that they needed to do. One is they needed to wake up. In verse number two, he said, be watchful. It means to be wakeful, be aware, to, to wake up. They needed to stir up. Also in verse two, and strengthen the things that remain. They needed to keep up. In verse number three, remember therefore how thou hast received. Keep up with what you've already learned. Keep up with what's already been preached to you. Keep on keeping on and making the main thing the main thing. And keep on uh, being a, a, a good spiritual church. And then number four, check up. In verse number three, hold fast and repent. And so the problem in Sardis is really the same problem with many churches I believe today. There were those who were in the church in Sardis. And when I say in the church in Sardis, I'm talking about people that attended, people who were members, people who were leaders in the church even. But there were people that were in the church in Sardis, but they were not in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had professed a religion, but they possessed no relationship uh, with God. And, and you see, it's a problem then of unsaved church members. And if we'll be honest with ourselves, we have to understand and, and, and confess that's a problem in modern day Christianity today. That's a problem in churches today. That's a problem in America today where churches are being operated, being led, or being run by unsaved people. Uh, there's a problem of unsaved church members. In Matthew chapter 7, and you recall these words, as Jesus would say, beginning with verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now understand this. These are some strong words, but when Jesus says uh, to such people, I never knew you, depart from me, he's, he's literally saying, you've never been saved. They said, well, Lord, we've done all these things. We've been in the church. We've prophesied. We've cast out devils. We've done wonderful works. We're, we're in the church. We're doing the church work. And he says, but I don't know you. I've never known you. And so there's a problem. The problem with people who profess uh, to be Christians, profess to be saved and, and very faithful to their church, very involved in their church, even leading the programs in the church, but yet they don't know Jesus. They've never really been born again. And that is a problem. Uh, there is a quote that's been passed around for many years now, actually for several years, because I first read this and saw it uh, way back in the 1980s, 30 plus years ago now, 36 six years ago now uh, that I've been in the, in, the, in the ministry as a pastor and, and then at times as an evangelist also. And, and in those uh, 36 years now, back in the 1980s is when I first ran across this quote. And you've probably heard it. Uh, many preachers have passed it on uh, through the years, but it's from Billy Graham. And Billy Graham said this, and Billy Graham, of course, in preaching the huge crusades, and the, and the thousands of people that come and make professions of faith. But Billy Graham said, and, is, and he's quoted as saying that, he says that when you examine the lifestyles of church members who profess to be saved, 75% may not be truly born again. That's what Dr. Billy Graham said. He said he thought that probably 75% at least who professing church members 
But when you examine the way that they're living their lives, that that 75% of them very likely are not born again. They're not really saved. They're professing, but they have no possession. They're, they're unsaved church members. And he later revised his estimate to, uh, it, was, it was later, he put out another, uh, 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 another quote, and, uh, and, it, and it has been passed on, but he later revised his estimate to say that he really was beginning to believe that 90% of people in America that profess to be Christians really are not Christians that they've never been saved. And he's talking about church members, collective church members especially. Now you say, well, maybe that's kind of stretching it. Well, maybe it is, but even anywhere, anything, anywhere close to that is a terrible thing, amen? And it's really, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, and so that was apparently the problem in Sardis, and it is obviously the problem uh, still today. And the only positive thing here that we can see and we can see it in verse 4 in Revelation chapter uh, number 3 about the church in Sardis. The positive thing here is that there was evidently a remnant of true believers within the church. And Jesus recognizes them in verse number 4. And he points out two characteristics about them. And so what are the characteristics of true believers within a church? that may be filled with unsaved uh, people. Uh, here's the characteristics. Number one, in verse number four, they were wearing the wardrobe of Christ. They were wearing the wardrobe of Christ. In verse four, again, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, and, and then notice these words now, which have not defiled their garments. Do you see that? They've not defiled their garments. They're wearing the wardrobe, the clothing, if you will, of Jesus Christ. You see, the word garments is used here in a figurative sense. I, I think that from studying it, we, we understand that properly. It's used in a figurative uh, sense. And, and, and by that, I mean that what garments are to the body, that is our clothes that, that we wear, what garments are to the body, so our lifestyle is to our soul. You see, Jesus is not just referring here only to the way uh, that a Christian dresses, but he's more specifically referring to the way that a Christian lives. As we said that uh, from the quote from uh, Dr. Billy Graham, when you examine the lifestyle, when you examine the way that church members are living, he said that, that it, it very well could be that 90% have never been saved based on the way that they are living. They may be dressing right. They may say the right things. They're active. They, they've got a name for themselves, like the church here in Sardis. They're doing things like we saw in, in uh, Matthew chapter number 7, that they're, they're, they're doing all these things, prophesying in the name of the Lord, casting out devils, doing many wonderful works. They're doing all these things. But yet Jesus told, uh, says to that crowd, he says, well, I've never known you which is another, simply another way of saying, well, you've never been saved. You've never been born again. And so it is a real problem in churches of unsaved church members. Jesus, I think, is especially talking about the way that Christians would live their lives. And, and, but understand, dress is important. I think we do understand that. Our dress is important. The way you dress does reflect the way that you live and the way that you think, and you just use the example just as a soldier uh, would wear a uniform, then the Christian should be wearing the wardrobe of Jesus Christ. Amen. We should be clothed in Christ. We should be wearing the wardrobe of Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean? Two things, according to the Bible. It means, first of all, that you put off the old. You put off the old. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 9, I remember we're talking about lifestyle. We're talking about the way that you're living your life. And so he's, we're to put off the old. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8 and verse 9, listen to this. As the Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, 
seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And so how is it that we uh, wear the wardrobe of Jesus Christ? Well, you've got to start by putting off the old. And you put off the old man. That is, you put off the old life. And, and, and it really means that you put off the old characteristics. And, and that can mean the way you used to talk or the way you used to dress or the places that you used to go or the things that you used to do. The Bible teaches us that when we put on Christ, we're to put off that old man. There's got to be a change, you see. We're not to live the way that we used to live. We're not to live for ourselves anymore. Instead, we are to start living for the Lord and for His glory. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 really makes that point clear where, where the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Now, this is talking about Christians. This is talking about believers. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so we, we're not to live for ourselves anymore. We're to live for the Lord because basically what the Apostle Paul is saying there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is we do not even belong to ourselves anymore once we have professed faith in Christ, once we have truly been born again, we do not belong to ourselves. We absolutely don't even belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to the Lord. And in belonging to the Lord, we are to put off the old man and the old characteristics and, and the old ways and, and the way we were. We're to put that off and we're to live for the Lord and for His glory. And so put off the old. And then the second thing that you've got to do to wear the wardrobe of Christ, you have to put on the new. You put on the old. If you put off something, then it makes sense that you've got to put on something. You don't want to go unclothed, do you? You want you put off the old clothing, uh, referring to the lifestyle, the characteristic, and so forth, the, the old garments. You put off the old clothing, the old lifestyle, but you put on the new over in Colossians chapter number three once again. Colossians chapter three, and this time picking up with verse number 12. Uh, the Apostle Paul goes on and he says, put on therefore. Do you notice now in verse eight he says, but now ye also put off all these. And he lists some things, some characteristics uh, some things you do, some ways that you, that you, maybe the way that you work. But then he says in verse 12, but put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. He says, verse 15, notice how it continues on. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Well, that's talking about a complete change in life. Amen. A complete change of your lifestyle. And so to put on the wardrobe of Christ, you can't be the same person that, that you were before. It, it, you've got to put off that old, but you put on the new. Now, let me give you this kind of an illustration here. If, if uh, suppose you needed, uh, needed a surgery, uh, and you're going to the hospital, you're having surgery done in the operating room. Don't you know that everything must be spotless? Amen. Everything must be so clean. It must be spotless in order to avoid infection. And we know that they do that. At least we, we hope they're doing it when we go into the operating room. But suppose the doctor comes in and he's, your surgeon comes in. And the doctor comes in with an attitude that says, I'm a doctor. I have my degree. 
I have my license. And so it doesn't matter whether I'm clean or not. And you're thinking, well, yes, doctor, it does. But, but suppose a doctor, a surgeon had that kind of attitude. Of course, we would, we would think we would never come across something like that. But suppose the Christian or the church member says, well, I profess to be a Christian. Uh, I joined the church. I've gotten baptized. I'm a member. Uh, I, I, I tithe. I give to church. I do all these things. And, uh, and, and, and when I die, I'm, I, 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 I'm hoping, I'm believing that I, I'm going to be in heaven. And, and so it doesn't really matter now how I live, does it? But yes, it does. According to the Bible, according to the scriptures, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, and you know the verses beginning with verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore... Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. It does matter how we live. It matters much how we live. And, and so the thing about it is, a true born-again believer, I believe those things have taken place. You put off the old, you put on the new. There's change. It's going to be evidence there. But there's a problem with, with people today, there's a problem in the church in Sardis, evidently, that carried the name of a Christian, carried the title of a church member, maybe even had positions of leadership and so forth uh, within the church, but yet they were unsaved. They were unclean, if you will. Uh, they claimed to be followers of Christ, but they had no relationship with Him. And so the thing about it is, they're the remnant, the remnant in the church there. Jesus said, thou hast a few names, notice a few names, even Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. What were they doing? Even in the midst of a church with, with uh, many in the membership that evidently were unsaved, they were wearing the wardrobe of Christ. They had put off the old man. They had put on the new. And then the second thing, second characteristic that we see about them here is that they not only were wearing the wardrobe of Christ, but they actually were walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were walking with Christ. Notice how he said again in the verse, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And then watch this now. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And he's talking, understand, don't miss this. He's talking about a remnant because we really see the picture here of a church that, that very likely the majority of people, he said, you've got, a, you've, got, you've got a name, but you're dead, spiritually dead. So the church as a whole, the majority would be the ones that are spiritually dead. The minority, the few, are the ones that have put on the wardrobe of Christ and, and that are walking with him. Notice how he, he said, he said that, um, that they're few. He said, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis. That word few is interesting. It, it is translated from a Greek word. It's actually an adjective in the Greek language. And, and the meaning is that it, that it is something that is small, or slight or, or little. Small or slight or little. That would be the meaning of the word few there. And, and so what we see here is it's a description that those who are walking with Christ within the church and who are wearing the wardrobe of Christ, they were in the minority. They were in the minority. In fact, we have the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 
that really show us that that true believers, true believers, uh, will never be in the majority. True believers will always be in the minority, even 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 in the end of it all. Matthew chapter seven, verse thirteen and verse fourteen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And look at this. And many there be which go in thereat. You can understand this verse and the application of it especially. He's talking about hell. He's talking about the, the eternal abode of the unsaved. He's talking about hell when he uses the word destruction. And he says there's a, there's a wide gate, there's a broad way that leads to hell. And why is that? Because there are a lot of people that are headed that way. They need a wide gate. They need a broad way to fit the people in. There are many uh, there be which go in thereat. But then look at verse 14. If you're looking in Matthew 7, verse 14, because straight is the gate. Notice the word does not mean a straight line, but it's, the word means a narrow passageway. And so, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And so, how would you interpret that? He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about the presence of God. And so, he says, uh, straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth into heaven, or into life. And notice how he said, and few there be that find it. Jesus himself said, tells us that true believers will always be in the minority. We will never be in the majority. Many years ago, maybe some of you can remember it back into, I guess it was in the 1970s, I think it was, wasn't it? When, uh, when Jerry Falwell started the, the political movement of the Moral majority. Do you remember that? That term, moral majority. Well, it sounded good. And, it, and that is a wonderful thought that the majority of Americans would have some morality about them. Well, we are a long way from that now. And the truth of the matter is, it's really somewhat of a misnomer because in the world, there really has never been a moral majority. There really has never been a Christian majority. There's never been a majority of true born again believers. And, and, and so true believers will never be in the majority. There's only few by comparison. Jesus said it's a wide gate, a broad way that's going to hell, and there's many going there. And then it's a straight gate and a narrow way that's going to heaven, only a few going in that. And so there's got, Jesus makes it plain. More people are going to hell than they're going to heaven. I mean, that's probably about as blunt or as plain as you can get it. But that's what he says there. And, and so uh, we'll never be in the majority. We'll always be in the minority. But here's the thing. And here's the problem, I think, in America today and has been for many, many years. And that is that committed Christians, and by that I mean real Christians, real saved people, real born-again people, Committed Christians are always in the minority, even in the church. And oftentimes in, 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 in the local church. And you'll see more of that, of course, in larger churches with larger numbers. And, and we understand that. But, but it's a dangerous thing. And one dangerous thing about it is you can, you can be... In, in the large church, in the large numbers, and be professing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you profess that you do have faith in Jesus, but then you don't live like it. You, through the week, you go off away from the church, but boy, you come back on church on Sunday, and you're just right into the worship and everything like everybody else. How many countless hundreds of thousands of people do you suppose that there is in America that have, that have a, a, a false understanding of what it means to be saved and because they are in those churches and they're there every Sunday or they're participating in the worship and the activities but how many is it going to be that when it comes to judgment day that Jesus says but I never knew you 
I never knew you. And they said, well, Lord, we've been a member of, we were a member of such and such church. Lord, I was a deacon of the church. Lord, I was a pastor of the church. Lord, I sang in the choir. Lord, I taught Sunday school. Lord, I worked in VBS. I did all of these things. But he says, but I don't know you. You never were saved. And it's so easy. Let's be honest with ourselves. If, if you just kind of examine like, I think probably the, the average you know, large church in America today or medium-sized church, whatever size you want to say. But, but, but especially, I think you see it in the num bigger numbers of people. But if we just examined that and then if we just knew how many of those people actually were living during the week and what reputation they had perhaps on their job or, or, or you know, wherever... And, and it, 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 it pans out like Dr. Billy Graham had estimated that maybe 90% have never really been saved, but they're involved in all the activities there in the church. The problem is there could be a false sense of assurance when people think they're saved when they're not saved. They think they're all right because they're in the church. They're a part of the church. I think that's what was happening in Sardis. They, Jesus said, thou hast a name. That, that, that thou livest. You have a name that you're alive. You, you, you profess to being a Christian, but he says, but you're spiritually dead. You've never been saved. And so it is a problem. And notice uh, when he says here also in verse number four, uh, talking about these are walking with Christ, where it says, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In the Bible, understand this, dear friend. In the Bible, the, the word white has nothing absolutely at all to do with skin color or race. Has nothing to do with that. Doesn't, you can't apply it to that. Has nothing to do with it. But the word white in the Bible is the symbol of purity and salvation. That's what it is. It's a symbol of purity and salvation. And just like in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, when Isaiah uh, says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's talking about purity and salvation from your sins. In Revelation chapter 7, if you want to just turn a page over from uh, or, or so from where you're at Revelation 3 but and look at Revelation chapter 7 and let me read a number of verses a few verses here uh, we'll pick up with verse number 9 Revelation chapter 7 notice how that John writes this now he says after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes do you see that clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon uh, the throne and unto uh, the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the, about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and, and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders, verse 13, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, uh, said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Now watch this. You ought to mark it in your Bible. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The word white there always has to do with, with purity but it has to do with salvation. It has to do with truly being born again, truly being saved. It has to do with salvation. And understand this, it always has, it still does, and it always will. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away sin. Amen. It's not church membership. It's not getting baptized. 
It's not doing all the things and, and being doing all the things in, in a church somewhere, but it is only the blood of Jesus Christ that can ever wash away your sins. In Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 23 and following, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who being set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, listen, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. When it says that He's the propitiation, propitiation through faith in His blood, we've already learned what that means. It means that, uh, that the blood of Jesus is what satisfies the wrath of God against man's sins. And it's the only thing that does satisfy God. Church membership doesn't do it. Baptism doesn't do it. Good works doesn't do it. The blood of Jesus does it. And so the only hope and the only way that we can have our sins forgiven and the only way that we can have that purity and that salvation symbolized in the Bible uh, with the word white and as we saw in Revelation chapter 7 to, to be clothed in the white robes the only way that that can be is that the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary's cross, it must be applied to your life and my life by faith. Amen. In other words, it's by faith that we would confess to God. God, there's, there's, I'm a sinner and there's no way I can come into your presence. And so I, and so I claim the blood of Jesus Christ as the covering and the payment for my sins. And the only way I am in the presence of God is because God sees the blood and doesn't see me. He sees the blood of Jesus more specifically. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. And you see, the thing that we need to realize is this. It, it is all due, all due to the grace of God and to the love of God. For in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, you remember how the Bible says, Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's provided it by His love. He's given grace. And He's made grace available to all men everywhere who by faith will believe and will trust and will receive the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood is the payment for their sins. And, 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 the, and, and again, the problem is the, the people who have really done that, who have really just understood that it's only by the blood of Jesus and it's only by confessing him by faith that I can be saved and have e eternal life. It's only by that that, they, that we are a true Christian, a true believer. And it's sad, but there are so many still today, like the church was in Sardis, who they have a name, that they live, but then Jesus says, but thou art dead, spiritually dead. So many that say, Lord, Lord, we've done all these things. We joined the church. We, we did all these things. And then Jesus would say, but I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see the truth of the fact that saved people really are in the minority, not, not just in the world or in the country, but even in Christianity, even within the church, churches as a whole, true believers are in the minority. And so what do we need to do? We need to be sure, we need to do like he told the church in Sardis. He says, keep, keep up what you already have. Keep up what you know. Keep up living your life as you understand that your life no longer belongs to you, but it belongs to the Lord. Keep living your life as a Christian be clothed in the wardrobe of Jesus Christ and walk with the Lord. 
and, 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 and know that your purity, your salvation only comes by the application of the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. He says, just keep, keep that up. And he reckon, he'll recognize it. He'll recognize the few. That's a marvelous thing to me. He recognizes the few. And he says there'll be a few com by comparison that will be in heaven. If you know in your heart that, that you truly have been born again, thank God that you're part of the few. Amen. Thank God that you're part of the few. Don't, don't be, you know, depressed that, that you're not involved with big numbers of people and so forth. Thank God you're a part of the few that are truly born again, truly saved. And, and, and thank God for that truth. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, church, for prayer. And as we do and, and prepare to have a song together also, let me just make a, just a, a few thoughts now for those that maybe be catching this message online. Dear friend, these are the last days. There's not a lot of time left. We've, we've talked about that. I, I, I would think that you ought to be able to realize that and understand it. But the truth of the matter is, you may be a member of a church. You, you may have uh, gotten baptized. You may have gone through whatever it is that your church has you go through to become a member. But in your heart, do you know that you've been born again? You see, there's only a few that really have been. Are you one of those few? If not, you need, to, you need to check up and you need to be sure. And Jesus said that him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So he'll not turn you away if you'll come to him now, if you'll trust him now. And so our prayer for you is that you would trust him now and, and put off the old, put on the new. Be clothed in the wardrobe of Christ and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ in white, in your salvation and purity. Walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and be counted as one of the few that will have life in heaven. That's our prayer for you this evening. Lord, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you for the marvelous book of the Revelation once again. And Lord, we thank you for how you've uh, spoken to our hearts as we've studied through it and the verses that we've examined thus far. Lord, we've got a long way to go. Lord, we pray that you'd help us as we just study these verses of Scripture. Help us to understand your word in such a fashion that we can really apply it to our lives. And Lord, we do pray for many, many people that are in churches today, that, are in, that will be in church this coming Sunday morning that are in church this evening for a midweek service, but yet they've never been born again. They've never really been saved. Lord, we pray that you'd help them, that your Holy Spirit would convict them, that you would show them the need of how, of, of how they need to truly trust you, Lord, before it's too late. And Lord, for that, we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. We get you a songbook, Brother Tim, come and lead us in our final song tonight. Page 451.